We have been busy with a series, a series on the fruit of the Spirit for two weeks now. And then last week we couldn't continue because of unforeseen circumstances. So this week we're taking on from there. Pastor Hyam was going to preach on peace. So if you know your fruits of the Spirit in order, you'll know that the third week is supposed to be peace. But he had already prepared a sermon for that. And I wasn't going to prepare a second sermon. Peace two weeks? Come on. We want peace for one week. Peace. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> so he's going to come back and do peace. Today I'm going to do a very difficult one. Patience. All right. So uh, uh, wish me luck. <laughs> Galatians 5.22 is our main scripture. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. I want to pause there. It's the Holy Spirit that produces that kind of fruit in our lives. And He's the one doing the work producing that fruit in our lives. And this is the kind of fruit He produces. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Hello. <laughs> Gentleness and self-control. It's the Holy Spirit that produces all of those things. Today, we're talking about patience. See what I did there? A little pause. So you had to wait for me a little bit. <laughs> We're practicing patience. We're practicing patience. And nobody likes to wait. I'm just going to get that out of the way. Nobody likes to wait. There's nothing unspiritual about not liking to wait. And that's okay. And that's okay. Go to uncle. There's uncle. No. Yeah. No, daddy. You preach next week. No, no. Patience, patience, practice, patience. <laughs> Nobody likes waiting. My son definitely doesn't like waiting. <laughs> he doesn't like waiting. Little story, we were waiting for his mom once. Not at a bus stop, but we are waiting outside the car. Um, we were going to fetch her at work. And so waiting there, we were still a little younger. So what happens is, one of, these are one of the truths of the Bible. We, when we have to wait, and we felt like we've waited long enough, we start to misbehave, right? It's basically what, so what he did, he came there fully clothed, but after 10, 15 minutes, I don't know how it happened, he was just in his nappy, and that, that's just how, what happened. He was running around, I had to apologize to everyone that's there, get him clothed again before mommy comes out so she can think I'm a competent parent. But, but one, one of the things that happens when we have to wait is we start to misbehave. We see it with Abraham as well, where he thought the first thing that came to him was God's promise, and it wasn't. That's how, I, uh, that's how, what's his name, Ishmael was born. But God's promise would come when he was 100 years old. And so because we have to wait, sometimes we misbehave. This is not even in my sermon. So you'll thank my son for that one. <laughs> I wrote a couple of things here. We want microwave food, faster internet connection. And even though I clicked on the video, if it buffers for more than 10 seconds, I'm clicking away. And the Wi-Fi better be free. We want fast food, and if you can deliver it so I don't have to wait in line, that is even better. I will sacrifice the 11th item so that I can be able to go through the express line. We play the lottery so we can get rich quick. You don't want a relationship based on commitment, effort, and integrity? Great, neither do I. So we're going to meet on Tinder, on, you're going to DM each other on Instagram, whatever people do on Facebook, and we'll just hook up tonight. This is the culture of today. And the world has seen that we don't like to wait, so they capitalize on it. They capitalize on it. And the danger is we don't notice that what the world is engineering in our hearts, we have sort of translated it to say that is how God should work too. It's, in, it's, it's convenient. It's convenient. I don't like waiting on things because I paid for them. I don't like waiting on people because what I have going on is obviously more important than what they have going on, right? I don't like waiting on God because I have faith and faith should give it to me now, isn't it? That's what happens. That's what happens. And the world has sort of fine-tuned this thing and, and got into our hearts. And we say, now faith. If, if we have faith, God is going to do it now. You know, it's not happening because you don't have enough faith. And we've heard sermons like that a lot. And I just, this is the one thing that I'm trying to come against today. And you see through Scripture, I'm not trying to be funny, but through Scripture, that sometimes the cost to what you're looking for is only 
patience. The price you pay for what you believe in God for is patience. What's on the price tag is patience, not more faith, not more faith. And we come up with reasons why we've waited long enough. And we lose sight of the fact that God wants to do something in us as well. And God says, of all the things that I could have wanted to produce in you, I found patience to be one of those important things. So much so that I sent the Holy Spirit to produce them in you because I knew you couldn't do it by yourself. So before we carry on, what is patience? This is the first definition I'm going to give you. It's basically choosing to move at someone else's pace. That's patience. If you're having a busy day and everything is happening fast and someone says, please slow down. Can you just help me withdraw this money before you leave? You're choosing to move at their pace. I'm like, wait, slow down. I want to learn how you do it. You're choosing to move at their pace. When your three-year-old son that has energy for days, the whole time, and everything is moving quickly and you just want to slow down, it is patience to move at their pace, to move as quick as they want you to move. That's practicing patience too. Moving at someone else's pace, moving at God's pace. That's the first definition of patience. And since we are, we are a church that exists to love God and love people, this will be a two-parter. So we'll talk about patience in relation to God, and then we'll talk about patience in relation to each other. Right. I think I'm a very simple guy, very minimalistic. I wear the same kind of pants every day. Not the same pants. <laughs> right. I just have the same kind of pants. All right. I have the same kind of shirt. I know exactly how many shirts I have. My pockets are usually empty, just my car keys and my cell phone. That's about it. If I have to carry anything else, it's too much. It's too much. I don't have a wallet because that's how I like it. And when they say that you could pay using your cell phone, that was Christmas for me because I didn't have to carry my cards now. Oh, it made life so much easier for me. So I went into this shop, um, and I'm a guy that if I order burgers and I like the burger in that place, I'm not ordering anything else every single time I go there. I'm just going to order it until, until I get sick of it, and then I'm going to order something else. That's how, that's how simplistic my life is. My wife hates it sometimes, but it's okay. She loves me. <laughs> so she has patience. So I walk into this shop, and I'm like, I'm going to try something different. So I order this huge sandwich that they have, and I'm like, all right, make it for me. How long? 20 minutes. Okay, I'm going to practice patience. I'll wait. I'm hungry, but I'll wait 20 minutes for this. So I waited 20 minutes, and then I'm happy. I'm imagining myself murdering this sandwich. I'm so hungry. I can see myself. I can almost smell it. I can almost feel it in my hands. And then the guy brings it out and he's like, all right, we're ready to pay it. I whip up my cell phone, put in all the pin codes that I needed to go in there because there's a lot. And then I'm like, all right, can I tap someone? And he's like, no, oh, I'm so sorry. We only take cash here. The level of disrespect. I was really hungry, so I did go to the bank and withdraw the money. But in my way, I'm thinking, I'm never going back to that place. They're stuck in the 1800s. I'm not, that's not happening. I'm not going, it's inconvenient. How can you not have a paying machine? Right, I ate it, I loved it. Um, that standpoint lasted for like two weeks because I really loved the sandwich. So I went back, so I was humble. And I'm like, okay, if they want cash, I'll give them cash. I'll make the extra drive just for that sandwich. So that's what I do now. Go to the bank, withdraw the money, then I can get the best sandwich I've ever had in my life, again. Again, what I learned from that is that there are some things, regardless of how much money I had in the bank, regardless of how much I grumbled and, and, and almost made a protest, regardless of all of those things, they only take cash. And if I wanted to pay, I would have to pay cash. And there are some things in life you will never get unless you have the right form of patience, the right form of payment, and that payment is patience. You can have all the money in the bank, all the faith in your heart. You can have all the love in your heart. You can have all the right intentions. But without patience, you're not going to get it. Without the right form of payment, it's not going to happen. That's the title of my message today, More Than Faith. Sometimes we need something a little more than faith. Sometimes faith is just not going to cut it. And before you stone me, it's biblical. All right. Hebrews 6, verse 10 to 12 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work 
and the help that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what was promised. Now Hebrews is big on commending people that have faith. There's a whole chapter in Hebrews 11 that's just commending people of faith. But here the Bible is saying that it wasn't just faith. It was more than faith. It was faith and patience that let them inherit the promise of God. Now what am I trying to do here today? I'm trying to convince you that just because you haven't seen the promise of God in your life doesn't mean you don't have enough faith. Just because you haven't seen what you've been hoping for for decades doesn't mean God isn't working. Just because you haven't um, seen what you know was promised to you doesn't mean it wasn't promised to you. We need faith and patience to inherit the promise. And, I, and I'm well aware that this could be a sermon that, that bums you out. Am I allowed to say that in church? I'm sorry if I'm not. <laughs> I'm sorry if that's that kind of sermon, but it's the truth. Sometimes we need more than faith to get the, the, the promise. The price take to some of the things you believe in God for is patience. You can get a husband or a wife with faith, but it takes patience to build a healthy relationship. You can step out in faith and trust God for a child, but you still have to wait the nine months. And you need even more patience when they become a toddler. <laughs> you can pray to God and get the promise and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. But it takes patience to finally inherit the promise. And you not seeing it doesn't mean God isn't working. Romans 12 verse 12, this has to do with, with, with those that are going through hard times. It says that be joyful in hope. So what you're hoping for, be joyful in it. But also be patient in affliction faithful in prayer. God is not just saying, I won't deliver you. God is not saying no. He's saying be patient in affliction. Maybe like Paul, his grace is sufficient for you. You prayed three times for the thorn to leave, and God is just saying, my, my, my grace is sufficient for you. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean God has forsaken you. Just because you don't see it doesn't, God, doesn't mean God isn't working. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean you don't have faith. Don't beat yourself up. God has a plan. He's the most creative being in the world, and I'm convinced that he can make anything work together for good. In the short life that I have lived, if there's one thing I am sure of, is that God is creative enough to make any situation, any situation, work out for good. Moses, 40 years in the wilderness, hiding because of shame, God used that to raise up a leader that was going to take his people to the promised land. God knows exactly what he's doing. Have faith, have peace in the fact that he is still working. It's not your fault that it's not happening. It's not your faith's fault that it's not happening. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. We have to trust God's timing. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Jacob waited seven years for Rachel, only to be deceived by her father Laban. He then had to agree to work another seven years in return for Laban in order to marry Rachel. Joseph had to wait many, um, go through many trials and tribulations before he received his vindication, justice, and freedom. Wait to see his dreams fulfilled and he waited to wait even longer to reunite with his family, and he waited even longer to reunite with his dad. Mary, the, fa the, the, the mother of Jesus, held on to the promise that God gave her for 30 years before she could be sure that this child is truly the Messiah. Remember, Jesus also wet his nappy like every one of us. Jesus had to grow in wisdom and stature, the Bible says. He wasn't born an adult. He had to be kept safe by his parents. And I'm sure 
that Mary had gone through sometimes where she, where she was like, is this really the son of God? She had to wait for him to die. She had to wait for him to be resurrected on the third day before she could be sure that was God's promise. Jesus himself, the author and finisher of our faith, had to wait 30 years before starting his ministry because God said, don't start yet. And then when he was 30, John the Baptist was ready to baptize him, and then he started his ministry. Jesus himself had to wait. The God of the universe himself had to wait. All the faith in the world, all the power inside of him, but he still had to practice patience, just like we do. But it didn't mean that he wasn't the Messiah. I'm not trying to take the wind out of your sails. God is still working. Sometimes the price we have to pay is more than just faith. It's more than just faithfulness. It's patience. I want to encourage you to wait because the only thing harder than waiting on God because it's difficult, the only thing harder than that is wishing that you had waited. That is way more difficult than waiting on God. And I've seen some couples, not in this church, you guys are perfect for each other. You guys are perfect for each other. I'm like, how, Mary, how did you end up with that dude? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. Sometimes I wonder how I landed my wife as well, but I had to wait. That's how, that's how you land a beautiful wife like mine. Hello. I had to wait. She was in a season of waiting. I was in a season of waiting as well. Don't rush God's timing. He will send the right person when it is time. Now, how does this relate to us relationally? And because this is even more difficult. A synonym for the word patience, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna get worse from here, all right? It's gonna get more difficult now. The synonym for, for patience is forbearance, which means to put up with people. To put up with people. I didn't like that when I read it. I'd much rather wait on God than put up with some of the things we have to put up with. <laughs> But the Bible says we have to put up with these people. So the Bible doesn't shy away that there are people in our lives that need a little bit more patience, that need a little bit more, I'm going to keep my mouth shut because if I say something now, <laughs> the Bible does not shy away that those people are there. It says that they are there and we should extend and we are the ones that should give them that patience. Ephesians 4 verse 1 to 3, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So the only reason Paul would write that is because some people just weren't clicking. It just, it just didn't happen. They had to put up, they had to forbear. I don't know if that's the right word, I'm so sorry. My English teacher is sitting right there, so you can, you can blame her if I butcher it up. <laughs> there are some people that need a little bit more patience. But how do we exercise this fruit of the Spirit when it comes to other people? I want to focus on just one thing. I could get, I thought of having like a six-step plan on how to handle difficult people and stuff like that, how to be patient with them, but I thought just one, just one is enough because this is already difficult enough. It doesn't help, I, I make it even more difficult with five-step plans. One thing, refuse to be offended. Now, this is very difficult. Refuse to be offended. But Rulani, you don't understand. I know they're doing it on purpose. There's, they, they keep doing it over and over again. Now you don't understand. Yes, but the Bible says that we should keep on giving them patience. See, behind every set of eyes is a story. And the people that are controlling or are mean, they're telling you something about themselves, not about you. See, sometimes we get offended because we think their actions reflect on what I've done or who I am or what it's going to paint me as if I don't do anything about it. But it doesn't matter how they hurl insults at you, what their body language is saying, or what kind of a look they give you or don't give you. If someone is rude, they're revealing something about themselves, not you. Revealing something about them and not you. And sometimes those things are just hurt. Hurt people hurt people. 
We've heard that over and over again. Behind every set of eyes, there is a story. And they have a story that made them become who they are. Yes, sometimes they're choosing those actions. But we have the mandate to extend patience. And even in a time where we do have to confront those issues, keep in mind the goal. Because what will happen is they'll, they'll, they'll hurl insults at you to get you to react the same way as well, to get you to, to act out of emotion and stuff. And the Bible says, just be patient. Put up with whatever they throw at you. And I know it's difficult. Sometimes it's easier to just say, you know what, I can't do this right now. Let me get a glass of water, we'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue. But we have the mandate to extend patience. We have the mandate to to make sure that we put up with what people throw. Jesus preached this over and over again in different ways every single time. The golden rule, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. If you were having a weak day, because sometimes you, you're there, you didn't sleep enough, you forgot to eat breakfast, so you are gonna be short with people. How I would want people to handle my weak days is just extend a little bit of patience. And so I'm gonna do the same even if your weekday is seven days a week, I'll extend that patience because I want you to do the same thing for me. Jesus preached the same thing over and over again. Refuse to be offended. Remember that behind every set of eyes, there's a story. Your spiritual maturity is largely determined by how you treat, by how you treat people who mistreat you. How mature we are spiritually, how mature we are emotionally, is determined by how we treat those that don't treat us the right way. And we should start extending that same patience that we would like people to extend towards us. Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, is doing just that when he is hung on the cross. And in Luke 23, verse 34, it says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He had every right to be offended because he was the only person that was actually right. But he chose to extend a grace and a patience that we have never seen before. So this is what I want us to pray. God, give me a thick skin and a tender heart and not the other way around. Give me a thick skin and a tender heart and not the other way around. Help us to practice this fruit of patience. It is a difficult thing to do. But we know that your Holy Spirit will guide us, will remind us, will empower us, will give us the strength that we need to extend the same kind of patience that we would like people to extend to us. Give us a thick skin and a tender heart. In Jesus' name, amen.